privilege to be here. I want to thank John, David, and Cassie for everything they've done to, to set this up. And, um, I was very lucky to have been invited to the Contesting Creativity Conference back in Kuwait, and that's when I met John and David, and David Perry and others, um, Felicity included. And ever since then, I've had this little fancy of sort of having been adopted by Leeds, and so I, I maintain this feeling that I'm a small part of the community, and they've been kind enough to stay in touch with various ways ever since. Um, so thanks. First, I should say something about the rather uh, pedestrian title of this seminar. Um, I believe it was in an email exchange with David around December or so that he asked if I might want to lead the seminar, and I wrote back something like, um, well, sure, maybe uh, I could do a seminar on how to read text written within a creative community. Uh, and, you know, capital letters in, 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 interspersed there later, and suddenly there's a title. Um, and now it sounds as though I'm going to train you. Uh, and some of you might th be thinking, well, he is from West Point. Um, and I, I put in my, my mind yesterday, uh, Henry Reed, today we have reading of texts. Uh, <laughs> yesterday, we had to, yesterday we had to travel by train. Uh, in any case, um, if I were to retitle this uh, seminar, it might be something like, and here's where the allusion or the echo, I think, of Felicity is coming into my mind, sallying forth hand in hand the work of a creative community or the work of uh, collaborative dissent or collaborative communities or something like that. In any case, here in what I think is maybe a hybrid, um, maybe I'm clinging a bit to the conference paper, but this is a little bit shorter, um, a way of starting the conversation. Uh, that will lead into the breakout groups. So today we have seminar one. I would like to begin this brief talk about methodology by acknowledging the work of a fellow scholar listed in the group reading for seminar three, Dan White, who studied under Stuart Kern at the University of Pennsylvania and completed his dissertation just a couple of years before I arrived. Because I too enjoyed the mentorship of Professor Kern as my dissertation director, and because I was likewise interested in the Aiken Barbell Circle and the Warrington community more generally, I found myself following very soon Stewart's advice and reading Dan's dissertation, which, as we know, became the superbly authoritative early romanticism and religious dissent in Cambridge 2006. I remain gratefully indebted to Dan's foundational work on collaboration within the Aiken Marble literary family. In Dan's article on the Joint Ariana, later, which became chapter three of the book, the trope of the jo Joint Ariana, the sewing together of loose fragments, comes to describe both jointly produced works, principally that sort of retroactively apply to the evenings at home and also miscellaneous pieces in prose, but also, and perhaps more important, a domestic familial-based model of collaboration that was to extend its influence into the public sphere. As Dan puts it, uh, the descending public sphere represents not a counter-public, but rather a subcategory of the classical public sphere, a fragment that exerted critical pressure from within, that's his phrase. The joint Ariana trope accurately accounts for the literary mobilization and subsequent exportation of dissenting virtues and values to the nation, the socio-political phenomenon itself, but it does not accept obliquely imply anything about the precise nature of the collaboration or how best to read the texts generated by that collaboration. I too see what he calls the, quote, collaborative nature of dissenting cultural production but my interests have been and they remain in the details of the collaborative dynamics, or perhaps what might be called the collaborative logistics undergirding that production. <clears throat> I'd like to offer, therefore, a different metaphor for us to think about, one that derives from the same domestic space within the descendant sphere, and that is emblematic of a specific method of collaborative production. And it's a trope that speaks to a conversable mindset within the Aiden Marble Circle, and beyond that, to dissenting rhetorical and reform-minded strategies. <clears throat> In Spectator number 60, one of the papers on wit, Addison defines a particular language game called Burime. I believe it translates as end rhymes. A list of words, this is Addison's definition, that rhyme one to another, drawn up by another hand, and given to a poet was to make a poem to the rhymes in the same order that they were placed upon the list. For Addison, there was no question that it belonged to the degenerate species of wit, and he professed not to, quote, know any greater instance of the decay of wit and learning among the French than the resurgence of this form's popularity in that country. But we do know from Lucy Aiken that this was a popular sort of parlor game enjoyed at the Warrington Academy, evidence for which is found in a pair of poems attributed to 
Anna Barbol and William Enfield, both of which can be found in the McCarthy and Kraft poems of Anna Letitia Barbol. <coughs> Enfield, arriving at the Warrington Academy in 1770, penned The Old Maid's Doom in response to a list of rhymes given him by the then 27-year-old Anna you know, Aiken. Rhymes like lizard, gizzard, shuffle, truffle, shooter, spheres, guzzle, muzzle, etc. McCarthy and Kraft identify then Boo Ream in praise of old maids as Barbold's clever response to Enfield's reciprocal list of rhymes. It's a simple language game, this one. One hand supplying the expostulation, if you will, the other hand supplying the reply, a necessary reply or a necessary compliment. The composite expression represents a simple form of joint literary production, independently written parts of a rhetorical whole. The long collaborative relationship of John Aiken and Anna Barbold is often defined by this method. Independently authored works meant to be read together with that gesture to each other in some way. And we see this model of cultural production at work in the independently authored pamphlets addressed to the opposers of the repeal of corporation, a repeal of corporation and test acts, and addressed to the uh, dissidents uh, on their late feet. The first being, of course, famous, and we all know that as by a dissenter, that dissenter being uh, Anna Barbold, and then this one by her brother. And they, on that day of publication, 17, uh, yeah, 1790. Uh, March 27th, had these reciprocal advertisements. So they advertised each other and were, in a sense, meant to be read together. <clears throat> the two pamphlets were occasioned by the parliamentary debate on March 2nd, 1790, and the ensuing vote not to repeal these acts of exclusion, which had long been prejudicial to the civil rights of dissenters. Obvious enough is the fact that Anna addresses the establishment while her brother addresses the beleaguered dissenting community. But the complementary aspect of the two pamphlets goes much further than that. And we also find, and I'm not going to enumerate that, we've, we've read these and, and perhaps we'll talk about that during the breakout sessions or and talk about other aspects too. But we also find this kind of complementarity at work in Sins of Government, Sins of the Nation by Barbold and Aiken's Food for National Penitence or a Discourse Intent for the Approach of Fast Day, sibling pamphlets, if you will, published in 17. 93 this time, although not on the same day. We likewise find a dialogical responsive aspect to certain essays within miscellaneous uh, pieces in prose, uh, in uh, magazine pieces that echo uh, letters from a father to a son, and, and on and on. I could use a bunch of examples, but I'll just say that uh, I could go on, and there are a number of ways the gesture occurs, the responsiveness occurs. And if we were to look for a genesis of this kind of uh, cooperation, we might point to John's Essays on Songwriting, 1772, in which he incorporated his sister's hymns. <clears throat> and it seems to have engendered uh, what I've called elsewhere collaborative consciousness, a term that's meant to indicate not only a mode of literary production, but also the reform-minded consciousness of the dissenting community as it strove to ameliorate various ills in society, everything from prison, you know, prison reform to slavery, women's issues, the poor, etc. But in actuality, the collaborative consciousness of Barbold and Aiken began much earlier still. In her epistolary verse to Dr. Aiken on his complaining that she neglected him October 20th, 1768, Anna recalls a scene from childhood in Kibworth, a kind of collaborative prehistory rooted in their shared uh, domestic education. It's hand in hand with innocence we strayed, and bosom deep in Kibworth's tufted shade, were both encircled in one household band and both obedient to one mouth. A lot two signs on one stem we grew. This kind of responsiveness I've been talking about, in both senses of that word, literally answering, but also exhibiting the sympathetic tendency to do so, is similarly at work within another creative community, at Liber the Liverpool abolitionists. And is especially evident in the authorship of the anti-slavery poem The African by William Roscoe and James Curry. And during an evening's gather of Curry and Roscoe and a few other friends, possibly at the Liverpool Literary Society or at the Warrington Academy or maybe at a book club, it's not exactly clear, discussion turned to the slave trade and the need for a song to complement Roscoe's blank verse poem, The Wrongs of Africa. In a letter describing the collaborative process, Curry, who's best known as the biographer of Burns, depicts an exchange reminiscent of the Boo Remain tradition. 
after each writer had failed to come up with a satisfactory poem on his own, they met to compare notes. And Curry writes, being hurried and despairing, being able to finish my own scheme, I gave my plan, my stanzas, and my sketch to my friend, desiring him to make use of them as he pleased, and at any rate to point his own song better. In a day or two, he returned me a sheet of paper containing a long poem, not less than 80 lines, in which he had introduced all of my lines without alteration, and had added most of his own. There was incongruity in the pieces you might imagine. Therefore, if you desire my valuable friend, I curtailed and arranged and altered it to the state you see. Thus, the abolitionist verse known as the African resulted from the exchange of incomplete portions of what became together a composite song. Furthermore, after it was published, the African represented, at least from the perspective of the abolitionist authors, a necessary complement to Roscoe's longer blank verse poem, The Wrongs of Africa. So in a sense, those two were intended to point to each other, intended to create a kind of whole, rhetorical. The complementarity I'm describing really points to a habit of mind that emerges within these communities, a habit that manifests itself in strategies of resistance and reform. If we look at dissenting creative communities, we will undoubtedly find the kinds of sociability and converse associated with other communal friendship and familial groups of the period. But I would argue that it goes beyond mere sociability and the acquisition of uh, polite or useful knowledge uh, that we've seen with the book clubs, for instance. Within the dissenting creative, dissenting creative communities, at least uh, that which emerged uh, in Warrington, there was much more at stake, desperately vital missions to accomplish. The creative strategies needed to pursue those missions had to overcome what John Aiken alludes to in the address to the dissidents, the establishment's well-oiled mechanisms of psychological repression, concerted efforts in effect to make dissenters seem not only insignificant, but invisible too. Thus we find in the realm of paratextual marketing, for instance, John Aiken's influence with like-minded Joseph Johnson in the form of advertisements that feature not related titles, but related authors, adds an essence for the dissenting family's heritage. Advertisements, moreover, that help to keep that dissenting legacy in the national consciousness. And there's a related strategy here, visible in the advertisement for Aiken's bi biography of John Howard, here. <clears throat> <clears throat> One way to overcome the, what he calls, false shame and modesty um, in his fellow dissenters, um, and something he, that they can decry in the, the address of the dissidents, would be to keep names like Howard and Priestley and Roscoe in the public eye by mentioning them repeatedly in print, in Aiken's poems of 1791, for instance, or his life of Howard, or in Barbold's 1811, in which all, she mentions all three. So let me make explicit something I've been suggesting more or less implicitly. Works written by authors who make up a creative community must be read alongside one another in order to contextualize and illuminate them fully. Only in this way, I believe, can we gain a clear sense of how the authors were interacting, how they reinforced one another, in short, how they mobilized the dissenting socio-cultural sphere within the larger public sphere in order to, as White puts it, create pressure from within. And I've gotten to the point where I literally I cannot read one author without wondering what's going on at this point in time with the brother or another member, what's he reading, what's she reading, what are they writing, what have they recently written, and, and it, uh, it, it inevitably reveals some sort of consciousness uh, within the community of the writers. <clears throat> A few final thoughts and questions. The Aiken Harbold Circle represents just one creative community during this period, and there are models based on friendship, especially as we've read of Coler uh, that of Coleridge and his circles, Lamb, Lloyd, Salvi, Thelwell, and others. And there are other familial models, the Wordsworths, the Godwin, Godwins and Shelleys, uh, the Taylors of Ongar, the Edwards, and again, others. We must add to these circles the networks of publishers like Joseph Cottle and Joseph Johnson. And we also need to look beyond England to supporting networks in America. And something that we talked about during our little um, group sort of introduction was that these networks, which seem invisible, especially when we've been focused on product uh, for a very long time in literary studies, need to be sort of activated, uh, need to be made visible so that we can understand how, um, uh, how the communities made themselves known and how they influenced uh, the national media culture. As we think about such matters and others, I can't possibly enumerate. Here are some questions. That, actually, one that jumped out at me that I didn't put in the little description of the seminar, and that's attribution. <laughs> uh, to whom do we attribute a poem resulting from a game of Boo Remain? Uh, the same could be asked of the African. In other words, how do we handle the confluence, to use Lucy Newland's term, 
uh, in her essay of literary thinking that precedes the final product, right? One way uh, Julie uh, uh, Carlson suggests it is to read the, the community as an author. She reads the God and Shelley family as an author in a sense. Um, another question that sort of keeps coming back, and I can't uh, get rid of it, is is there a theory of the complement to be worked out here? I don't know. Uh, it's sort of a mania lately with me. Um, thinking about supplement, supplementarity, you know, sort of Derridian predecessors. But when we talk communities and specifically this kind of interaction, is there something that might be said in the theory of the complement? Um, let's see. How do we know, I asked this, but how do we know that the creative community was recognized as such? I think one way you know is when the opposition calls you out. Some of you will recognize that's Croker beginning of the review of 1811. Here I guarantee you there's a confluence of thinking uh, because I was in Nasser in the room with Felicity and she talked about Roscoe 1811 and, and dissent. But this particular phrasing it jumps out and we, we sort of forget that there was another piece written in that exact issue of the quarterly that basically uh, it was a scathing attack on, on Roscoe. But here, Barbold, forget about the, the shagreen spectacles and the nude eating, and she was sallying forth hand in hand with her renowned compatriot in this resolution of saving the sinking state, pamphlet and prose, pamphlet and verse. And, and Roscoe had written a letter to Henry Brown on the subject of reform and the representation of the people in Parliament. Um, they recognized this. That's what's so cool to me, is they recognized that the dissenters were up to this business of working together separately but toward an aim, and that you could read the things side by side and recognize that there was a rhetorical process involved here. So um, with that, uh, I will um, end and invite you, if you haven't uh, been able to print off the copies of the readings, um, Cassie unbelievably made copies of all the readings, and they're, they're here in the room. So yes, so as we go to the, the breakout groups, um, I encourage the same kinds of wonderful conversation that began in our group, and I'm sure that began in other groups. And if there's anything here that sparked something wonderful, if not, then you can you help me, and we'll go a step further. Thanks very much. Approximately 15 minutes total for this this little portion. So maybe just a little recap of four minutes. About this. Questions, issues, things that you that you found uh, particularly pertinent. Uh, so we were talking about the David Fairer um, chapter, both in terms of the way um, David brings out the, um, the possibilities and potential of the creative community, but also the, the fears it engenders in its members and some of the problems. And we were thinking that it fitted in quite nicely with what um, David was saying at the beginning of the day about the ways in which community can both foster um, creativity, but also occasionally stymie it and stifle it. And um, we were talking about the ways in which um, this community, which gathers itself around, which Coleridge gathers around himself in their story, acts as the descendant of the Pantisocratic community, and then how he gradually becomes frustrated with it and seeks to it um, through, um, through the mind in Bottom Sonnets with a very public exposure of some of the dearly held values of the community. Um, we were talking about points of Fisher and Jeremy brought up that he felt one of the points of Fisher of this community might be the idea of, of literary merit. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, in fact, just to sort of turn on you, um, Felicity uses a nice phrase about this being a community that's imploding from the start, um, a community that's kind of built on um, the um, personal anxieties and the reasons, um, the, the, the sort of things that the members of this community looked for in one another, um, they all knew one another couldn't supply, and so the reason the community existed were, were the sort of same reasons that this community couldn't sustain itself. Um, and we were um, thinking about how questions of literature play out both in courage reacting against the quality of the poetry that um, Charles Lapp 
Charles Lamb and Charles Lloyd seem to him to be writing, and also how these questions of literary merit play out in um, criticism nowadays, looking back at these texts, um, trying to make sense of the difference between a, a poem like to be by my prison um, and Lloyd's much uh, tenser, more private poetry that doesn't kind of articulate itself with its own form to the same degree. Um, and that's, that's what, how Coleridge blows up the community in the Nehemiah Higginbottom sites so so by saying that Lamb and Lloyd don't write in the way that he wants them to write. Mm -hmm. uh, we were also talking about the ways in which um, we've been discussing this as a community or network, but um, Stephen brought up the fact that people don't, don't talk about the words with Coleridge network. Um, I don't know whether you wanted to. How do we nowadays use the term network community? And, um, and that in some ways perhaps that's been overwritten by, um, by, by later um, words with Coleridge scholarship. We were also talking about um, the, Hartley, the, the importance of Hartleyan philosophy in this community and Dave Farah opens with a very nice discussion of, um, of Coleridge attempting to, um, to theorise a um, friendly community and um, the, the importance of private attachments moving outwards. Um, but as Farah points out, ultimately that is quite an uneasy scenario which, coming back to our point, um, we are making earlier carries this threat of implosion um, from the start that it might that private attachments might simply burn themselves up and, and not move outwards to the wider community. So have we have we covered your question? Very nicely, I think. Uh, and, 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 and since my group volunteered me uh, as its spokesperson, I'll pick up on that idea of public and private. So what we'll do is just sort of summarize and then go into the larger discussion where we can cross talk. But that that public uh, versus private um, tension, uh, we in our group, and one of the reasons that I thought this reading by this essay by Lucy Newland would be useful um, is because it, uh, it draws attention uh, to that face, the public face of Wordsworth William, the eye of a certain poetry, <clears throat> and then reveals behind that the sort of private conversations or tries to activate some of the conversations, other source material, other um, spaces of interaction that inform that public eye. And then how do we account for, how do we, how do we think about that confluence of creativity? creative confluence that precedes um, the ultimate publication. And, and what it, what's particularly interesting about uh, the essay is it points to ways in which the critical tradition um, has pointed to ethical questions, have pointed to uh, Wordsworth as um, perhaps questionably uh, pillaging um, the thought. And, and, and then masking that in some way. And so there's, there's been some ethical heft to positions taken in the past. And I think that she complicates that very nicely, uh, although what we, what we came to see was there remained, and, and Emma brought this up, there remained at the end of the essay um, an impulse almost to see Dorothy as the resource that supports, so that it was a sort of one direction, and one of the important questions that she raised, I think, is why isn't it um, more uh, bi-directional? Why, why do we read the, the prose into the poetry uh, as the supporting hand, so to speak? Is it not possible that it happens both ways, and, and how do we know? Um, and really, that began to open up questions that uh, spoke to a couple of different things. One, John helpfully pointed out, the recoverability. How much actually can we recover? We may have some journals to turn to, letters and other things. Um, but in terms of imagining a conversation and trying to fill in the gaps, uh, 
some, sometimes creatively as critics, how much can we, how much weight can we put on our own uh, interpretations there? How, how much is recoverable, and then how much do we want to stay on that? Um, the let's see. the engagement with metaphors, though, we thought um, was helpful in terms of trying to read the relationship, uh, and there were a number of ways to do that with uh, with William and Dorothy and I. Not particularly here because this is out boxed and we're looking at different uh, poems, the, the daffodils, the pearly youth, Tintern Abbey, but the crossing of the brook um, as an interruption. This happens though also with, with in the Raspberry Journals, I think it's 16 times Dorothy describes the pair of them walking backwards and forth, backwards and forwards, this sort of becomes its own trope uh, for uh, creativity. Um, what ultimately maybe we seized upon, and Tessa really brought this out, was that at the end, maybe the argument ought not to be how to configure the influence of the conversation or the, the hand of Dorothy helping to create the words word poetry, but maybe it's about the unknowability. It's given the nature of that creative process, really the argument perhaps is that we can't really pin it on someone end of the day, it, the argument maybe that we can't know. Um, and if we can't know, that raises, that comes back to a question about the ethics of the process. Um, to whom do we point when in fact something goes forward and represents a community, right? And, and if that I has been altered into a we in some ways, right? Or the I's elided altogether. Uh, and if that piece of writing, an abolitionist poem for instance, makes a real statement and, and, and causes a ripple effect, right? A political sort of, to whom do you turn, right? And uh, how does that uh, reflect ethically? How do we think about that uh, in terms of the ownership uh, within the community? Uh, I will just say one, one note, sort of sum this up. I really also like just the simple fact that what Lucy Newman does in this piece is turns to a couple of different sites of, of creative conversation, including the mutual reading, the shared reading of Gilpin. And, and I think it's exactly that kind of analysis that can at least help us to understand that sort of space of consciousness, what Emma called the, the sort of trace of interaction that's going on at a point in time. The journals are lovely in that they're, they're dated and they can help us see things and can sort of cross, um, uh, coordinate those with letters and drafts and things like that. But I just wanted to point out that the, the, the basic move, the methodological move of, of pulling journal and poem and reading and, and activating that consciousness, I thought was very helpful. I'll come up with a nice sort of segue from the discussions as well, so I'll just, I'll just watch it. Um, if anyone else in the group wants to uh, correct or add to what I say, feel free. Um, because we were dealing with, with primary texts, uh, I suppose our discussion probably works slightly differently from the other two groups. So we did we did say a bit about how those texts were working and the, the differences and similarities between them. We talked about um, the way in which they both share um, a design of the fact to get away from the label of dissent and also question the idea of toleration with all the sorts of things that toleration entails. We also talked about the way in which Aiken moves quite quickly and sort of illogically really reading to you, whereas Harold uses we, even though she's actually not talking to the dissenters per se. Um, and I suppose that tied in with, and then we move on to some broader conceptual issues, issues of address. So who, what, what is the readership for, this, for these texts? Both the imagined readership and the actual practical readership in terms of the availability these texts, which may have been quite limited. Um, so we thought we thought about issues of circulation, I suppose. We also thought about um, the fact that they were published anonymously and looked at the, the list of other texts that you provided us with um, on this, towards the, in relation to the uh, Tesla Corporation Act, some of which were anonymous and some of which were. And I suppose, and I probably pushed this more than the others, for me, that made me question the issue of um, whether thinking about the biographical sort of familiar relations as the basis of talking about these two texts is always the right way to proceed. 
how much is what they're doing as a duo sort of specific and particular to them? And how, or how much do they partake of a much wider discourse and a way of talking about these things um, amongst um, uh, dissenting groups that might be, might be quite common? I suppose it's a sort of, it probably goes back to sort of Foucauldian approach to texts. Um, that do we actually need to think about um, how useful is that familial context was a question, I think, to me. And in relation to that, um, a couple of other people talked about ideas of exclusion as well. If we think about the address of these texts, but firstly there's the idea of what, what, a, what, what a sort of familiarly, familiarly produced text might exclude, but also text that perhaps claim to speak for um, a large section of society, but are actually a, 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 a speaking to, um, towards a sort of section of the middle class um, and forgetting about um, uh, the, the working classes or the labouring classes as well. And I suppose in relation to that with the dangers of, of heroisation that often this Unitarian centres are sort of attractive to humanities and academics at least because they seem to be sort of uh, left liberal and aggressive and congenial. Um, but and the difficulties of reading those texts and not thinking perhaps always hard enough about what these texts and what the ideas within them exclude, what communities are not really um, addressed or even thought about in these apparently very sort of liberal and progressive texts. Does anyone want to add anything? Okay, that's it then. Okay, <clears throat> terrific. Thank you very much to everyone for that. Um, your thoughts and that input. Um, I, I, I maybe I'll just start by responding uh, to some of the things that you said there uh, as a way of really just moving the conversation along. But um, could you elaborate on the, the when you said this sort of danger of heroization? Um, what could you talk a little bit more about that? Where you see that and how that's Sure, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll start with an anecdote as a time I'm away because often it means you don't get to the point. <laughs> um, I, I, I run this network for improvement group. I've got a PhD student working on the Manchester Dead Phil, who Abe Kim was involved in, although not, I think, a member who themselves are very sad as possible because that looks like women were present. Uh, and um, we've been reading his tract on whatever it is, 25 miles around Manchester. And the PhD student had been reading, reading Capital at the same time, not John Manchester and Karl Marx. And she said, well, you know, this is, these reformers want to reform the world to make it better for themselves. They want the vote. They're not necessarily Democrats. And she was making the point that they're all wealthy. They all are interested in the circulation of knowledge. And as David Harvey would say, the circulation of capital. But the liberal, the words used by it can not only get the mechanism. And so, it's very easy, I've done it myself, I'm not like this criticism, but we find ourselves in them, like liberal humanities, they look like us, you know. And it's very easy to think about, you know, they're, they're obviously excluding members of the establishment to a point, but they're also describing themselves in a certain way. In fact, Aitken very explicitly talks about the middle classes and why they're not the progressive for. So I think that's something we always have to be aware of. I don't, I'm not saying let's be Dave Sparks and say, because it's much more complicated than that, that there is a, some authentic working class, that, that's not the point. But I think you, in, in writing about these things, we need to think about, you know, that there are lots of dialogues going on, including some that are exclusive. And then the other more local thing, which I've written about in places, including my review of the Daily Prayer, is that friendships and families are funny kind of things. They're very specific relationships. They're not, you know, for instance, what did other dissenters who were progressive who wanted to publish think about a kind of Bible hugging the market? You know, I mean, what, what, what a family relationship is a kind of privilege of a certain sort. What did other people, even sympathetic to them, think about that? Uh, what it, um, it comes into your literary merit thing as well. I'm interested in the way that Wilson and Coleridge figure their relationship as a special one, excluding other sorts of sociable relationships they have. And often ideas of genius are fixed about very close friendships, where friendship is a very different thing from community. You know, if I'm your friend, we're probably we're not excess friends. You know, so I think when thinking about those collaborative models on both those levels, on the more immediate and on the larger social level, it's important to think about what they exclude as well as what they include.
this, that, to this. There are moments where the Aiken barbels are criticised for their um, for their exclusivity, mm -hmm. and others are looking at them and feeling um, feeling definitely excluded from their from, from their vision of community. Um, so I think I think John Clare may have something to say about this, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, and other younger writers certainly feel quite, um, quite quickly about the way in which they're hogging the market and, and that they have a, quite a homogenous view. What, what, which younger writers do you I'm blanking on who it is, but um, he's a... Uh, about who it is well, it's just, I find it a little bit curious as a way of thinking of it because, you know, she was a rarity bubble. I mean, it's not as if <laughs> there were sort of tons of people wanting to, <laughs> to, to sort of come behind, behind her. So I, I just don't, you know, I don't know who she would be keeping out or even whether just the fact that she was, and she wasn't particularly prolific. Well, well, just the fact that she published I, every now and then would stop other people. It's more thinking about friendship and family as terms. I'm not, not so much, as I said, bagging out Barbold for that, but yeah. thinking about the way that if we're going to use friendship and family, we might think about them structurally as what they exclude, rather than sort of blaming, blaming her. Because I think, I mean, one of the things I've been interested in the Manchester Lit Phil is they very early on write an essay about the importance of female learning and how they see their idea of improvement. But as far as I can see, no women got to go to the meetings. And that's another form of exclusion. Dissent often seems very open. It talks about female education. But if you actually look at lots of the clubable and social activity, women were excluded. And indeed, you know, Barbara was at Warrington, but she's not a student, as you know. So there are things like that, I think, always to think about. It's just, it's not about criticising them as a peer, it's just thinking about, I mean, when we think about things as forms of inclusion and collaboration, we might also be thinking about what they're excluding. I think the norm was exclusion of women, really, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I, I think by that standard, their circle was remarkably inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in class terms, you know, there was a lot going on there, wasn't there? I mean, they were looking at that moment over the channel and seeing what they saw as the revolutionary middle class transforming the society and obviously felt this was their moment, you know, and that it would bring benefits for the whole of society, including the labouring class. Um, so, you know, they, they were, were perhaps, or perhaps definitely <laughs> deluded in that way, um, but it was an understandable delusion. And yeah, it was no, certainly but, progressive. But again, it, it's not about blaming them for what they think, it's about thinking, and probably it's a guilt when Jenny turned to me and said that. Because I've like, you know, you're largely inevitably working on middle class formations. As soon as can, I mean, I am actually working on the LCS and stuff, but the, which have a lot of female labour involved, although not many women writers, in fact. But, but I think we, it's just that we need to, I think, keep that in mind. It's not so much you're blaming people for being middle class. I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. But I think bearing that, that their idea of improvement is, a, in some sense, a political radical one. And one of the things I've tried to be warning this, sorry, this is not meant to be a therapy session for them. It's true, I was a supervising PhD student. Especially when she sees this podcast, so we turn the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, as well, there's also obviously a game of teleology. Yeah. Because although these, are, these become the 19th century elite, and you can track the names, where things become relatively informal book clubs, then it becomes the city council six years later. Yeah. It's like, but there's a danger of reading the future into the past. But at the same time, a lot of these families are very wealthy. They do have dominant position. So I think to lose the fact that, for instance, that Aiken track about improving the landscape around Manchester is about making it more efficient as a manufacturing base mm -hmm. and feeding large numbers of labouring classes into factory jobs. I mean, he would have had humanitarian... There were complications about it, right, but I wouldn't want to forget... That's what I'm saying. I wouldn't want to forget that perspective. It's not about... I don't think the point... Nobody was making the point that you know, Aiken and Barbold are in it for, for themselves. I don't think that's the point, especially because I think you're exactly right about Barbold's virtual unique, uniqueness, I think. One, one thing that might, just to maybe uh, alleviate some of the concerns of the, of the student is that if you look at- You need to adjust the camera. <laughs> 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 but 
you know, there was something at stake. And when Aiken continues to pursue the political pamphlet work, and he's living in Yarmouth, eventually the establishment makes moves to um, take away his, he was a doctor, a practicing doctor, mm -hmm. basically put him out of business yeah. so that he had no livelihood and he had to move. He had yeah. to move from Yarmouth, no friends, no, you know. So there was something at stake for but him. But that's not going to leave it. I mean, she, I said that kind of thing to her. She said, but ultimately they were suffering for themselves. Now that's, that's more crudely, she didn't put it that crudely, but there's a sliver of truth that, well, that that's not quite an answer to the, the larger dissenting community. And one of the ways that, I, I mean, it's, we might say there's some exclusion going on, but the other thing to say is it appears that they were the ones recognized and speaking for the dissent, larger dissenting community, this, regardless of sex that they were able to take on that sort of identity, which says something, right? They're, they're, yeah. It's like they're edging out a bunch of other people yeah. to do that. So when I think about you know, how hot an issue this was, and that there were only so many weeks before this has got to be in the window of Joseph Johnson's bookshop, and I've got to coordinate so that I'm not, I'm, I'm talking, my messages are accurately sort of sent here, yours are there, you cover these, I cover these, that. How does that happen? It just doesn't happen. No, no, I buy all that, but I don't think it's still. I mean, I don't also want to give counter examples in case we go. Do we get back to think that they were weak community? But I think I still think that doesn't answer the fact that they. Uh, for instance, in 1796, the Manchester Correspondence Society writes to the London Correspondence Society saying, "The two acts have been passed. Everything's closed down. We expected more support from the manufacturing class, which means the Aikens, the Manchester literature, and they said they're nothing. You know, they've all just accepted it and gone on." Accumulating money and writing, you know, letters to the monthly magazine. Now that's not, you know, I'm not. It's not that one should sit with the heart, with the, from posterity looking back and judging them. Mm -hmm. It's to realise that those tensions are there and are shaping this field. But I don't think it's, I don't think it's a question of questioning people's personal commitment, or in the fact that individuals with it may be more or less democratic, you know, or more or less humanitarian. I'm not suggesting these are all wicked factory owners existing behind a smiling, happy face. I just think it's something that, it's a, it's a, if this is a field, if a field of forces, to use Borgia's, shapes what is the literary field of production, you, it, it's a, it's a, it is a field of forces rather than a space. And that field of forces is shaped by tensions and, and exclusions mm -hmm. and counter, and that's, that's really all I'm, I'm saying. It's not that, they, you know, it's not to doubt their genuine commitment, or that, that some people may have been more or less democratic. Or the fact that they face prosecution and imprisonment. I just think it's a thing we have to take account of that shapes the field. I mean, it's been, it's been attentive, isn't it, to that historical process? I mean, like some of the other examples that we've, we've read in preparation for today and tomorrow, uh, like books, for example. I mean, books that are in one situation, in one year, mobile, that suddenly then become instantiated as a collection and then become reified into a library. I think it's being appropriately attentive to the, to the opportunities and the exclusions that pertain to each of those processes, um, which are not simply, as you're think rightly saying, simply you know, ethically wrong or um, you know, censorable, um, but actually contain positives and negatives on both times of what our job as uh, appropriate historians of the period, is to be aware of the moral implications and social implications on both sides. I mean, the library actually might lead to more people, even though it might, you know, it might um, militate against certain, you know, ideal notions of a, of a of a knowable community that we might have for other political reasons. But we've got to be open and upfront about how those things uh, modify and 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 the shifts of opportunity and exclusion that are always simultaneously involved. In. No, that's right. Yeah. Cut whatever I said and keep that. I'm very eloquent to tell to say what I think. No, no, no. It's that, it's that, isn't it? So it's not about, bl as you say, it's not about blame culture. It's about being attentive, to, sufficiently attentive to the complexity of, of the historical yeah. process. I mean, so, just, I mean, to put myself in your point of view, which is the one, just writing them off as middle class. Yeah. It's just not in, I mean, it's just not it's just not interesting. You know, it's like so that's that all over and you lose the sense of the complexity and the fact that they're in process and like, like the fact that you're drawing attention to the reflexivity of our discussion and our community and you know, it, it 
we're just not used to the middle class being talked about as something visible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But we probably feel it should be yeah, yeah. <laughs> more, you know, or a certain kind of middle class. So I don't know. I, it's, it, it could lead to interesting questions about what we're doing to. I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about aesthetics. Mm -hmm. I mean, going back to Jeremy's point about you know, the Wordsworth Coleridge scenario, or Coleridge's um, yeah, um, exploding, <laughs> as it were, the, um, on the basis of literary quality. I mean, it, I mean uh, maybe, I don't know, I mean, but people have got other contributions to make. Extending it beyond literary aesthetics to other kinds of quality, about a regulation of quality within the processes of thought and conversation. That's to say, most of these people are operating with key words and concepts uh, to do with quality, such as improvement. And what are the implications of operating upon a dynamic of improvement and other key words of quality for exclusions? In other words, even a very basic level of exclusions on the grounds of competence. I mean, what kinds of incompetence, as it were, um, are allowed for within any of these groupings? Seems to me to be a really interesting question. I mean, can, can you manage the text, you know, he says to himself, that, we've, that, that I've been reading for today? You know, I don't have enough time to read them. Did the rest of my life, you know, as I was trying to cancel them, <laughs> allow me to read them carefully enough? Or do I have the mental capacity to, to read them. And I think some of those, those constituent elements within the human beings that make up these groups and what they're capable of attaining within intellectual labor by way of quality mm -hmm. is a really interesting question that has some really serious implications for the de democratization mm -hmm. that's supposed to take place. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone's got I, I think that was very, that issue was very interesting brought out by the example you gave Scott at the beginning of the, of the um, Roscoe Curry poem because it, you know, it wasn't simply that they merged their ideas. They wrote their individual things, one thought, but they, they each thought they were inadequate, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, one passed to the other, thinking, you know, with the, as a compliment that he would improve the thing by combining them. Um, he managed to include all of each of their lines. <laughs> so there's very, very delicate negotiations yes. going on there in terms of quality. And then it was passed back again to the first person. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's there with, with Bob and Aiken, too. I mean, what always strikes me about Aiken is how extraordinarily non-competitive he is with his sister. I mean, that is, that's really extraordinary. He always seems to be very willing to pay tribute to her. Um, and it's her, um, it seems to have been her um, uh, pamphlet on the dissenting issue that, on, on the testing um, and corporation acts that won attention. Know, that was considered the best by outside observers. Um, that didn't trouble him. You know, that, so there needs to be an extraordinary sort of degree of, of non-competitive, non-proprietorial um, attitude to the public sphere, which um, or, or utterances in the public sphere, which is very yes. striking. But also, also in the privacy thing, where people are commenting on each other's poems and you know letters. And I mean, it seems to me that, uh, that the smallest version of this idea of inclusion and exclusion is, is editing, isn't it? Editing mm -hmm. other people's work. And mm -hmm. what words or phrases are, are allowed in and what aren't allowed in? Yeah. And I mean, uh, it's a while since I read the Vera chapter, he talks about that relationship where they're all sort of editing and commenting on each other's poems, mm -hmm. which works up to a point and then starts to break down, doesn't mm -hmm. it, in quite powerful ways. And I, I just. Will the network enter a third meeting? We might do a book, so that would be of course cause all kinds of problems. But it's it's what the what are the rules of, of editing and responding to other people's work? So I mean, we all do all the time. It's it's a constantly you're constantly sort of tacitly negotiating with the other person, aren't you? What what what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable? And it's really hard to to manage that, and I think when you can actually plot that out, as I think David does to some extent, it's quite, it's quite incredible, I think, to see those tiny little, little movements. And this, I suppose, answers or is one of the questions Scott asked about what does a text look like that's been produced out of the community? It, you know, it exists in multiple drafts. It looks like it's got different people's handwriting. 
and you know we might still be able to see traces of its internal inconsistencies in the apparently finished product. Maybe that's what a sort of exemplary text produced by community is that mm. kind of contains that form of heterogeneity in it. And something I think Lucy talks about with the elusive quality. There's so much in the friendship poetry, right, or the poetry of the friends that becomes immediately elusive and self-referential. Yes. It's just the community it is it living through it. Yes. So we've got. Um, they very talks about this beautifully. The way in which this line to bow becomes a, um, both in its imagery and its illusions a poem of relationships that's all about um, working together. And yet, of course, it also includes the image of gentle-hearted Charles that, that, that is fiercely disputed by, by its subject. And within it, it also carries the memory of Coleridge overwriting Lamb's silence. Um, so that this is a, um, a one, of one level an exemplary poem of community, but it also um, exemplifies some of the major problems of the fact of We have to think about it. I mean, I've always been rather bored by Talanta Marajan's reading of the conversation approach, which is that you know, he inscribes conversation in the text. I mean, it's before Foucault, sure, I said, but you know, conversation is inscribed in the text to produce some third position. Which is synthesis, but it's really Coleridge. You know, so that Sarah in Sarah interrupts. You seem to listen to her voice, and then you, you know, it allows you the position that is no longer Coleridge or Sarah in the text, but it's some point of transcendence. To put it crudely, similarly in that poem, you know, there's that the classic reading of it as really that the not being with them is better actually. And it's interesting that there's that anecdote that Lamb himself objected to being named in a poem that in some ways is about not needing to have been with Lamb. You know, that it's better to be in a lime tree but a prison because you're allowed a kind of richer experience and that. So I think I, the simplest, one may disagree with those readings, but I think one thing to say is in thinking about forms that go from the sociable, we, it's important not to forget mediation, i.e. That, that, that we shouldn't assume they represent what happened. They have some sort of relationship to it, but that relationship might be quite complicated. It might just not just reflect it. So there are ones where kind of conversation is built into it, but it may not be traceable back to conversation as such. I've always thought, I mean, this came up, I think, really interesting. The words of the Coleridge thing, I mean, in a way, Lucy Noon's work is the end of a long tradition. It's always been happy about talking about illusion between words of the Coleridge, because it's, they're both geniuses and it's properly literary. And in a sense, they build that into their poetry. You know, why, the only other person in the prelude, in a way, is Coleridge to an extent. Dorothy, their special kinds of relationship. And that goes back to it. So is the point, I mean, it's part of the point, they're literary merit, you know. Courage and Wordsworth define each other as people who have got it, as opposed to other people who haven't got it. And and the problem, for someone like me, I'm always likely to go to that, that road. My problem is when somebody says, but isn't it true they both have it? And other people don't. And I just go, well, let's not talk about that. <laughs> I mean, I don't entirely agree with that. Anyway, I've got a quote at the end of my paper where, so they write to Humphrey Davy about all these people in Bristol and says the fact is, Beddoes and people, you say what you like about them, but they don't get, they can't do poetry. And he says, interestingly, two people who, you know, I haven't come down to this in the kind of a Sully and Davy, that we do, we, we have, a, our friendship is this spark, which is a spark of genius, which is seen as some sort of communion, which is different from just the messiness of social interaction. I think that's the thing you often find. If you, if you can do it, you're in the club, but if you can't, but there's clearly other, it's never quite just aesthetics, is it? You know, it can be gender, it's a, you know, the way Coleridge flips about his estimation of Bible. He thinks he's a genius in, in the middle of the 1790s, 10 years later, he thinks he's an kind of old gusto. Well, so, 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 I mean, just going back to competence in that, I mean, mm. in, you know, in terms of regulation and requirement for entry into a dissenting academy, I mean, we're talking about a selection process that is based on forms of attainment. So, you know, the, these, these, this, this is quite rigorous processes of selecting out and selecting for, th which are prior to Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also, we might reflect on our own situation in that regard. Yeah. How do we come to be? <laughs> 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 Who dropped out? <laughs> well, well, let's stop it now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to have to leave.
Well, you are the selector in chair. I mean, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so wriggling after the food co in the room. <laughs> um, but uh, perhaps we could um, thank Scott for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah.